Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Managing with Mind and Heart podcast. I'm Ethan Nash, and I am really excited about today's episode. Today, we have brought on a guest, and she's really good. Very insightful. I think you're going to love it. Who's the guest today? Her name is Deborah Ancona. And who is Deborah? Deborah is a professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, aka MIT. You might have heard of it before. Um, and she's in the Sloan School of Management. She's best known for her pioneering research on high performing teams, distributed, nimble leadership, and leadership signatures. Deborah is also the founder of the MIT Leadership Center which is revolutionizing traditional leadership to solve the toughest problems in the world of management. And her book, X Teams, which you've got to check out, gives deep insights into how to create innovative, successful teams with examples from Microsoft, Takata, uh, the Museum of Modern Art. So she also co-founded X Lead, which develops research-based tools to encourage creative leadership across management levels. Um, her work bridges theory and practice, bringing novel ideas into leadership practice. Deborah has been with MIT for over 20 years, and in 2018, she was uh, awarded the Jameson Prize, which is MIT Sloan's highest teaching honor. In other words, she's really good at what she does. Her widely acclaimed research on how family upbringing affects workplace behavior was published in the Harvard Business Review, and it is titled Family Ghosts in the Executive Suite, and we'll be talking about that in depth today. Additionally, um, her article on four caps plus model was um, titled In Praise of the Incomplete Leader was also in the Harvard Business Review. So I hope you enjoy the show. All right. Well, welcome to the show, Deborah. It's good to have awesome. you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, well, I'm excited you're here. Um, we were talking before we hit record here, and I was um, letting you know that um, I'm I'm a bit of a fan, a bit of a fanboy. I don't know if I would go that far, actually, but uh, I really enjoyed digging into your work, reading your articles in Harvard Business Review. So. I've just been looking forward to this conversation and there is like, I feel like there's like 50 different topics that we could discuss and I'm going to have to figure out how to be focused here. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for starting out that way and vice versa, taking a look at your, <laughs> your leadership models. And I think there's a lot of synergy. I think so. Yeah, I think so. Well, then maybe let's, let's start here. Could you just kind of give you the floor for a moment. Can you just tell our listeners maybe a little bit more about yourself, why you decided to go the career route you've gone and, and what you focus on? Sure. Okay. Why I decided. I, I'm not sure that it was that thoughtful a process uh, of, of getting into the field that I'm in. Um, I, by, by happenstance, took a course way back in, in college in organizational behavior and really loved it and decided to go and get a PhD. And um, I'm not sure I knew what it was really going to encompass, but it's been a great, a great ride because I, I really love learning more about teams and individuals. And as I move on in, in my career, really like to help people develop more, to become better at who they are, to create more effective teams and to help in organizational change. So uh, it's really, it really is a, a passion. That's an overused word, but it, it really mm -hmm. is uh, something I love to do and, and I'm excited about. And the work, I think the work flows into three different buckets, if you will. Mm -hmm. The first is individuals. So uh, my colleagues and I at MIT Sloan have developed a leadership model I should step back a moment and say that all of the models that, that I've been working on uh, set as a premise that we live in an exponentially changing world. 
Yeah. It was always VUCA. People talk about VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. But this is VUCA on steroids. I say that all the time. <laughs> VUCA on steroids because the pace of change is accelerating. We're just going faster and faster and faster. And so the question for people is, oh, what do I do now? What, what do I do in this world? And so we have an individual capability model that looks at what are the different dimensions or capabilities that leaders need. Uh, we also uh, worked for much of my career on what makes for effective teams. And the model that comes out of that um, is a model called the X team. And Henrik Fresman and I have a, a new a new book uh, out on X teams. So um, that really is what do teams need to do to better adapt to this mm. externally changing world. And then finally, have done some work on how do we help organizations move from bureaucracies to more nimble, agile learning, whatever you want to call them, companies. This is a big transition we've been we've been moving toward for quite some time. But again, everything is accelerated because of, of what's happening. So that's kind of individuals, teams, and organizations. And then more recently, because I'm a psychologist by training, I've been having a wonderful, wonderful time uh, looking at what we call ghosts, family ghosts in the executive suite, and how people's family dynamics from when they were young play out in the executive suite, uh, sometimes mm. for the better and sometimes for the worse. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hope we can touch on a few of these these topics today. I do just want to point or mention, of course, that I'm, I'm just glad there are people like you and your colleagues and your teams, you know, doing what you're doing. I don't know if, I mean, especially along the line of just looking at the acceleration of change in the world and the workplace. I know, you know, personally, I work with a lot of leaders that are, are pretty just scared about that in general and wondering what are the skills and behaviors we need within our teams and organizations that allow them to be adaptive in this type of environment. I know when I was in grad school, um, the stat that I remember is something like a skills half-life is something of like six years or something. I'm wondering if that's actually gone down in a sense. Maybe it's more like three or two years, but it's just a really important topic to be covering here. And then you mentioned the family ghosts. With that, this is one of my favorite Harvard Business Review articles that I've read in a long time. Um, and I think it's titled Understanding Family Ghosts in the Executive Suite. Is that correct? Is that the title? It, it, well, family, family Ghosts in the Executive Suite. Family Ghosts in the Executive Suite. So you co-author co -author this fantastic article. How did you even stumble upon this concept? Can you tell us more about that? Uh, yeah. So first of all, my co-author is Dennis Perkins, and Dennis has been playing around in the family systems world for for a while. So I had I had read some of his work, but the real, I'd say, catapult in this direction was was my own leadership development journey and kind of the realization in my personal life, as in many other people, when, when we look at our own personal lives, whether it's our relationships or dealing with anxiety or whatever it is, uh, we tend to look at family patterns. That's what psychologists do. And so in our personal lives, we're very free to go back and say, okay, well, what happened when you were a child? And I learned a huge amount from, from that process. But then one day I just realized, wow, these same patterns that I've been f finding in my own personal life are playing out in the workplace as well. And maybe the, it seems crazy that not to have seen that before, but it's, a, it's almost an aha moment uh, where I said, oh, you know, I spend too much time trying to please other people. I'm, I'm a pleaser. That was something that I was brought up to do. And I'm doing that at work. And that's not, I mean, in some sense, it serves me because it helps me to get ahead. But what that means on the negative side is that I'm not saying, what is it that I want to do? What is the impact I want to have? And mm -hmm. so that allowed me this, this idea of taking these dynamics and bringing them into the workplace was very powerful. And I've now been teaching a course called um, Discovering and Developing Your Leadership uh, signature to senior executives, and they too find it very eye opening. Oh, that's why it's so hard to make these changes. That's why I'm doing this in the executive suite. So, mm. 
it was really that aha moment that that got me into this. That's really interesting. And, you know, it's a, it's an experience I've had as well, you know, just in terms of reading your article, then having some realizations about some of my own family ghosts that are impacting my behavior and leadership style. And, I, and I'm curious because, uh, you know, for, for me and some other people that I've talked to about this, we can recognize some of those family systems and family ghosts that are impacting our behaviors in our personal life. Like we see mm -hmm. those early, but for some reason, there is almost a disconnect between that's actually showing up in the workplace as well. Have you put your finger on that a little bit uh, of why there's a, that kind of disconnect? Well, uh, we've, we've thought about this a lot. I, I think part of it is that we assume that our family system, our, our interpersonal life outside mm -hmm. of work is where emotions play out and where these dynamics would come. But somehow we enter the organization and there's a boundary, the boundary of rationality and that's not supposed to play out and we are our maybe intuitive selves at home but we're the rational selves in in the workplace and i think that workplace norms play a role in that as well this is not the place to uh, be engaging in self-discovery we have work to do and when we have work to do let's get to it and I don't want to really know about your your ghosts or any issues that you might have. So I think right. it's it's both discouraged and we have a, a barrier in our own minds that it doesn't belong there. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And you and I both know that plenty of emotions play out in the workplace. In <laughs> fact, some of the most emotional situations I've been a part of or have been witness to came in the workplace where people are having to make really difficult decisions. So... It doesn't surprise me, um, not one bit. If you don't mind, I know this is always a little awkward. I just wanted to read a quote from the article because um, I found it pretty powerful. And then I'll ask you about it. I know it's always weird to have your quote read to you. So just bear with me here, Deborah. But um, the quote is, the That's theory fine. goes like, <laughs> yeah, the, the theory goes like this. If you want to become a better leader, you have to seek out feedback and engage in self-reflection. Do that and you'll come to understand your strengths and your weaknesses, which in turn will allow you to embark on a program of self-improvement. In practice, it's not that simple. Even if you know exactly how you want to change at work, you often find you can't. Now, my question is really just, why is that the case? Like, What prevents us from changing even when we know exactly how we want to change? And how do family ghosts fit into this? Yeah. Um well, in, in some sense, that's what has propelled this research, this idea that some things that we get feedback on, we can change immediately. Okay, um, I need to uh, be a better listener, so I'm going to do X, Y, and Z and, and make it happen. Whereas for others, they get stuck. And it's those stuck moments that are really interesting to me because often stuckness reflects something that is related to your family system. And it's a behavior or a belief that's so deeply held that you might not even realize that it's playing out and yet it's getting in the way of, of what you're doing. Um, so some examples that might help clarify this is um, one person uh, in, in one of my workshops um, brought up the fact that he could not really advocate for his ideas in the organization. Uh, he just mm -hmm. couldn't do it. He he was good with his team. He was good on all kinds of other things. But when it came time for him to really advocate for the team, he couldn't do it. And part of the reason as he began to understand it and unravel his family system was that he grew up um, with a sister who had learning disabilities and his parents were both working. So his job was to help his sister. He was supposed to help her with homework and, and other kinds of things. He was the helper. But at one point or several points when he was a teenager and you didn't always do what your parents wanted you to do or what was the right thing. He, for example, one day went to a party. He didn't help his sister. And the next day she failed a test. And his mother mm. came at him and said, you're so selfish. All you care about is yourself. You, you don't think about the family. You're, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. And uh, you're just selfish. And that 
that label, that selfish label stayed with him. That was what he was called in the family, the selfish one because of these instances, even though he was very helpful. So for him saying, this is my vision for my team became something like that, that he was being selfish and thinking about himself and his team and not others. And so he was stuck. He just couldn't do it. And so as he began to understand that that was what was going on, he was able to step back and say, okay, that's what's playing out. I'm afraid that people are going to see me as selfish. I'm afraid that I'm going to reenact that role uh, that I had. Um, and mm -hmm. so what we did with him or what he did, I, I just helped the process along. People do the work by themselves. But what he did was to reframe a, a big part of helping people to move ahead from problematic ghosts is reframe. And I, I mm. spend a lot of time writing uh, on, on LinkedIn about reframing. And mm. reframing is how do you take a frame that's not working for you and shift it so that it does? And in this case, um, rather than I'm going to present my vision, which for him was read as selfish and I'm doing things just for me, we did a reframe of get that into your helper mode. I'm helping my team by presenting what it is that we could do together and what they can accomplish. And if I don't do that, then they're going to suffer. So mm. that's a very different framing. It's not me selfish. It's me helper. I'm helping the team to move ahead. And that's one of the key reframes that can help people uh, to go from a self-centered frame to an other-centered frame if part of what your bad ghost is, is that I'm selfish or it's all about me and that's a bad thing. It's, that's mm. not good to bring focus to yourself. So reframe from self to other. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's a really good example. As you were explaining that, I, I had this thought, I, you know, sometimes when I think about strengths and weaknesses in the workplace, for example, I've heard before that maybe there's no strengths and weaknesses. It's just context dependent, right? A, uh, a behavior can be a strength depending on the context or a weakness depending on the context, right? I'm really flexible. And people say that's a strength in a lot of scenarios. I'm able to pivot quickly. But in a different context, it's like, well, you're super wishy-washy and, you know, whatever that may be. And I'm wondering if you think, is that similar to this concept of family ghosts where, you know, at some level, your family ghosts were a useful mechanism for you, right? They were protective for you at some point in your life. And depending on the context, it's a good ghost or bad ghost. Yeah. Um, so I think they are related. I guess the, the way in which I think about it is um, you identify the ghosts that are playing out the most strongly for you. And I've been teaching this concept for, for quite a while now. So uh, some of the uh, really the ghosts that permeate the executives that I work with, one, uh, one of them is work hard. Work hard, do your best, um, and that's great. That gets people very far in in their careers. The way in which it's not just contextual, but the way in which it can kind of flow from positive to negative is if you become a workaholic, uh, mm -hmm. you can't stop. Right. It's just always have to be perfect. Everything has to be perfect. Everything has, every I has to be dotted and every T has to be crossed. Mm. Then it's not so good. Uh, similarly, um, the pleaser, <laughs> I, I said before that that's um, uh, wanting to please people. The good part of that is that you meet goals and people are, are happy with what you do. Um, it can go into you're in the pleaser mode and then you lose yourself or you're too involved in pleasing others and not enough about getting your own group together and setting your own goals and your own uh, agenda. Um, and let me give you one more. Uh, another really powerful ghost that we find is, uh, again, in these senior leaders is to be independent. I can think on my own. I can get it done on my own. And that was always rewarded in the family system, et cetera. But okay, now we're in a world of autonomy and distributed leadership and empowerment. And so uh, if you can't ask for help, if you can't let others do some of the work, uh, if you can't delegate, you're going to be in trouble. 
in this world. So the positives can be negatives. And um, here, one way to think about how do you manage that is um, with the Gestaltian psychology idea of we have different identities, we have different parts of ourselves, and maybe we need to be a little bit more of an orchestrator of these different selves. So in some instances, per your your question, um, you might want to take one ghost that you have, one way of being that's really helpful in a situation and bring it center stage. And another that's not so helpful, maybe you're trying to get a team to work together. You need to take that independent ghost and sideline it. You go, you go side stage or backstage mm -hmm. because my more compassionate, let's work together, team-oriented self needs to come out and be at play here, center stage. So you need to kind of become, um, again, an orchestrator or the uh, designer of your stage um, mm. and say, okay, what, what ghosts are going to work here and which ones are not? And be aware that even though you think you may be bringing something forward, those other ghosts that are backstage or offstage may sometimes come in, even if you don't want them to. And, and that's a learning process is how do we deal with those? Yeah, that makes sense. Hmm. Well, it seems to me, and just correct me if I'm wrong, of course, like the first step with any of this for, for an individual that wants to kind of work on this stuff is, is self-awareness, right? They have to be aware of how their behaviors are, are showing up in the workplace and which ones are serving them and which ones are no longer serving them. I'm just curious, do you have a place that you would start with leaders on just the self-awareness piece? Yeah, um, so... Uh, when I am teaching this in my leadership signature class, um, so again, teaching, taking these executives through this process, uh, first thing I have them do is, is read the article uh, that Dennis and I wrote, the HBR article, mm. Family Ghosts, and begin to have them just write out a little bit about, in your family, what were the values and beliefs? In your family, what role did you play? Uh, in your family... Uh, what secrets were held. Um, mm. yeah, so so that you begin to understand. So there are six of, of those. Uh, how did you obtain mastery in, in your family? Uh, what kinds of boundaries did you have? Uh, so just go through that and start um, in conversation either with yourself or find a, a partner or a group uh, and start talking about, okay, what, what are those values and beliefs and roles and secrets and boundaries and mastery? Um, and then sort of say, okay, what bubbles up from that? Uh, what is serving me now? What, well, first of all, what that I, that was true then is still true now because not everything from your family comes to, to comes out in the executive suite. So the all first right. thing is what, what really am I seeing now? Um, so I always tell the students, this is not therapy. This is how do we advance your leadership? So mm -hmm. there may be things that are important uh, in your past, but this is what's showing up now in the workplace that is from that time that's either working for you or not working for you. So begin to, to get that down. And people seem to be pretty well able to identify what what those are. They know, um, you know, what is it that that's really getting in the way? Uh, and then starts the question of, um, all right, well, well, what scares you uh, about changing? What is it that you would have to give up? What role that's so important mm -hmm. to you is going to be problematic? Um, a, a big one uh, for for some of the people that, that I, I work with is going to be in a more listener coaching role from the individual contributor role. Well, if in your family, you were always rewarded and loved and so, because you were the ideas person, you made things happen, that's who you are, that's your identity. And yeah. then you're saying, oh, wait a second, um, I have to listen more. I'm, I'm not just about me succeeding, I'm about helping the group to succeed. That's a, that's a fairly large change. Um, yeah. And I have to listen more. Well, that that's a threat to my identity. That's a threat to what has gotten me positive reinforcement in the past. That's even how I've moved up in this organization. It's all about me and my ideas. Um, and suddenly I'm getting feedback that I have to listen more, that I have to pay more attention, that I have to give people more autonomy. 
So identifying, okay, what, what is the major thing? What is a goal that you want to achieve? And why is it scary for you to change in this case? Because I give up a piece of my identity and what I know how to do. We like to do what we know how to do. And it's scary to, to move elsewhere. And then we start this process of reframing. So if it's scary, you say, oh, I'm going to become a listener. That's scary. I don't want to do that. That's not who I am. Then maybe what you do is a both and rather than either or. It's not I'm going to give up my identity, the mover, the shaker, the inventor, the entrepreneur in order to be a listener. It's both and. Mm. I'm going to be the entrepreneur who also listens. I'm going to be the mover who takes into account what other people say. So it's a both end. So it's not as threatening. So doing that kind of reframing and then the difficult, the difficult work of learning how to do it. How do I then take this idea of listener and, and pull it into, add it into my identity is not easy. Um, so there, uh, we pull on the work of Herminia Ibarra on the idea of provisional selves. Of find some role models in your organization. There are eight zillion TED talks. Everything is available now. Who, who is both of these? Who is the entrepreneur who listens? You might mm. look at Satya Nadella and say, okay, well, how does he do that? How does he maintain control while also incorporating the ideas of other people without getting stuck there? Somehow he's not stuck. You're stuck, but he's not. Or mm. a cohort, someone who can do what you want to do without having the stuckness. And then you become a detective. Whoa, what mm. can I do? What does he do uh, or she do or they do, whatever it is um, that... Again, multiple role models, not just one, but what did they do that I might try out? Okay, maybe it's I listen for the first five minutes before I come into something. Maybe it's I have town hall meetings where I get a lot of input before, again, I take on what it is that I make of all of these things. It might be that for certain tasks, I put other people in charge so that I'm delegating in that way. Whatever it is, you want to say, okay, what do these people do? What do they say? How do they say it? What is their tone? How do they hold themselves? And then create a provisional self. Let's try this on. Let's try on the skirt from this person and the top from this person and create an outfit that I'm going to try on. Mm. Wow. Again, so many, uh, just a lot of light bulbs going off in my head right now. This makes, this makes a lot of sense for me. I, I, I especially like how you, you know, this, this reframing portion of this, right? It's both and. I find that many times, and I'm looking at myself first, that when I see that I want to create a change in myself, my mind mm-hmm. goes to kind of a whole cell identity change, right? Okay. A little bit more kind of. It's either this or it's either that. But this both and, to me, it strikes me as you're actually honoring yourself and your identity. Mm -hmm. And you're not necessarily trying to say, let's get rid of this ghost, right? Let's let's be done with this. But rather, can we add some more characters here that will Mm complement this this ghost right here? So really, I think that's really powerful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we, we all have multiple identities. We all have multiple roles that we play. The, the question is, you know, how does that work? Um, one woman was the jokester in her family. Everybody loved her jokes that she was invited to all the family. Everybody loved that. And her people loved it. Um, but again, um, moving into the senior team, the joking was seen as inappropriate. Um, mm. And so it doesn't mean, oh, I have to kill that off. Um, mm. It means... Again, the Joker may have to go off stage during my interactions with the senior team. I see. Okay. Well, Deborah, I'm curious if you'll kind of go somewhere with me here, and perhaps this is a dead end, and that's okay. But I'm I'm wondering if we might practice this in real time. So, you know, say I was your coaching client, for example, and I've you know, identify maybe one of my ghosts, uh, my family ghosts, and I'm interested in shifting some of my behaviors related to this family ghost um, in my leadership style. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe 
start the process of coaching me through that for a moment? Like, where would I go from there? Yeah. Well, you say you've read the article. So if you've read the article and you've looked at your values and beliefs, the roles, et cetera, when you look at all of those things, is there one thing in particular that stands out or a couple of things in particular that stand out as fundamental? What, what are the strongest ghosts that play out in the workplace for you? Yeah. I start with that question. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one that I've identified. Um, and by the way, this has been a multi-year process of identifying this through self-exploration, mm -hmm. feedback from colleagues, so on and so forth. But I think one of the strongest goes for me is just independence, independence. And, you know, I grew up in a family. We, there's, there was four kids in the family. I had two older th sisters and I also at about age nine, we adopted a younger brother and he had a lot of, he had a lot of needs. And so I think that I kind of had to learn to just be independent on my own as my parents were, um, you know, putting a lot of focus on my younger brother and my two older kind of strong sisters. And so I learned very much to do things on my own, be self-dependent, you know, figure things out on my own, et cetera, et cetera. So I recognize that's a very strong ghost in my life and has shown up in the workplace quite a bit of being very independent, which hasn't always served me in a, you know, CEO position and leadership position. And so that's what I would then ask, um, how has this ghost served you and when does it get in the way? I believe where it served me I mean, obviously is... You're doing I'm just going to interrupt for a second. Obviously, you've started your, your company on your own. Obviously, you run this podcast on your own. So you're doing a lot of independent work, even though I'm sure you have other people with you. But um, again, when when does it serve you and when not? Yeah, so it where it serves me is when something when something needs to be done, I can get it done. I don't know how else to put that, but generally I can do it quickly because I'm not always needing to rely on a bunch of people around me. Um, so if it's a difficult thing to do, you know, give it to me, I'll get it done and I'll give you the, you know, end, end results and products of this. And that has created, I think, a lot of efficiency in some levels It's built some trust with people that I can be relied on. And where mm -hmm. it probably has not served me is people not feeling included or that their ideas, skills, talents were honored, meaning there are people that would say, I think if I was included in this process, we could have, it could have had a better outcome or a better result. And I think that could lead to some morale issues and just lack of kind of inclusion in what we're doing here as an organization. Yeah. So if I would come to you and say, uh, okay, what scares you hmm. about not being independent? What scares you opening up to others? I think what scares me, I mean, I think there's a, maybe a practical reason, which is maybe it won't have the autonomy to kind of handle this how exactly I want to handle it. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, that's probably the main thing that scares me, that autonomy. So you worry you'll, you'll, you don't have autonomy. Another way to say that is that you would lose control. I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Lose control you over the situation. Control. Yeah. So you worry that it may be chaos if you if you include others. Do you think that maybe it won't be done as quickly, that it won't be done as well? Yes, Do you I, think, I think not done as well. But if I maybe unpack that a little bit more, it's yeah, maybe that is it. Not done the way, ex you know, that I think it should be done, which I guess can be translated into maybe not as well which I know okay. kind of intuitively that's not necessarily true, yet it's something that still gets in my way, right? Which is kind of the point right. of this. And hmm. maybe it's even a threat to your identity. Mm -hmm. You are the leader. You are the independent one. In your family, other people needed things, but you are, you are the one who could do things by yourself. You could do things on your own. As a leader of your company, um, you are seen as I'm the problem solver. I'm the creator of new ideas. I'm the one who gets things done. And if you include other people, maybe that role is a little bit threatened. Yeah, I think Does so. That I think so. Yeah, it's 
it's interesting. Yeah. So, so I think the answer to that question for me anyways is, is yes, it is an identity piece. And one thing I've reflected on over the last several years is kind of this, this image that I have in my head of this identity of kind of a lone wolf as cliche and cheesy as that is that serves me in many ways and many ways it's, it's no longer serving me. Right. So, so we want to really understand that you're, you have these uh, tapes in your head. That's what happens. You get the, the idea of reframing and so on. It comes from cognitive behavioral therapy and you have mm -hmm. these tapes in your head and those tapes are saying, uh, if I get others involved, I will lose control. There will be chaos. Things will go awry. I will lose my identity. People won't come to me anymore. Um, people will go off in all kinds of crazy directions. And that's really scary to you. Um, and so, again, we can do the, what are some reframes that you can use? Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I wish I had more time with you, but a, a couple <laughs> of reframes might be um, from either or to both and. You don't have to become the uh, touchy-feely leader who gets everybody in on everything. You can be the lone wolf who brings others into the, you know, in when it's necessary, when things can, can um, be helped by multiple inputs um, from what we call hot to medium. If it's hot for you, inclusion, inclusion, maybe inclusion is a bad word or autonomy mm. for others is a bad word. Or there are certain things that, um, that are getting in the way, then you might reframe this as um, instead of I'm going to be less independent, it's I'm going to be independent. I'm going to be the lone wolf um, with helpers. I'm going to be the, the lone wolf who occasionally brings others in to share hmm. things. Um, yeah. You don't have to let let go. And if there's something that's that's bothersome, maybe, again, autonomy for others or giving up control, what, whatever's getting you going here uh, in, in a negative way, you want to change. Um, so um, hmm. and then after you did that, you'd say, OK, are there any role models out there? that are both in control, the identity of the leader, the one in charge, and also able to involve and engage others. Yeah. And then what you want to do is try some things. Okay, well, maybe uh, for this particular um, activity, instead of me taking over, I'm going to ask everybody to provide some input or I want to get everybody in a room and say, what do we think the priorities are? You know, what do you think is going on? Or you're going to let someone else on your team lead the meeting for the day. And then you're going to say, how does that work? Uh, is it working? How do I feel? Does it make me too nervous? When I gave up my uh, independence, did everything fall apart? Was there total chaos? You want to convince your brain that the assumptions that it has are not necessarily true anymore. Maybe mm. they were true at some point in time, but they aren't true anymore. And right. that's the work that has to be done. In addition to visioning, this is the leader I could be. This is the leader I could be. I could be someone who is in charge, but has a team that's excited to work with me that isn't saying, you know, it would be better if we were included. That would be saying, thanks for including me. Um, it really has made a difference and I feel better. Um, so have that image of the future leader you want to be that then you are working, you're working toward. Nice. Yeah. Well, I think that's my, my homework from here is I want to start maybe identifying some of those role models um, and, and then move to that visioning phase. So thanks for going there with me, Deborah. That was, I hope that was helpful. I don't that, know. It was I helpful. Think, it was, it yeah. was, it was very helpful. It also reminds me, I, you might be familiar with the model, but the kind of immunity to change model, it seems very similar to that where you're looking at what is the reason why I think I can't change yes. in a sense, right? What am I trying to protect? 
And we absolutely, absolutely use the work, uh, the, the Keegan and Leahy model of immunity to change. I take people through that all the time to identify some of those assumptions that are getting in the way and the fears that are getting in the way, and then, um, and then move to much more focus on, okay, what do we do from there? What does mm. the reframing process look like? And how do I reframe my assumptions? How might I even reframe my goal um, in mm. some way, shape, or form? By yeah. the way, if anyone's interested, um, I have a course, uh, an online course uh, called Unlocking Your Leadership Signature uh, that's run by MIT and Emeritus. So oh. if anyone wanted to go into more detail on this, um, that's a resource uh, awesome. for anyone who's interested. Awesome. Well, I will um, link to that in the show notes for our listeners to, to find that. That sounds terrific. Well, Deborah, the last question I have, at least on this topic here, is... I'm curious uh, with just your experience and expertise, um, you know, how can organizations create really a supportive environment that can help employees, executives, whoever recognize some of their own family ghosts without overstepping some personal boundaries here? Yeah. Well, first of all, I would not make anything mandatory. Uh, <laughs> in fact, People in my class always say, oh, this should be a required class. And I say, absolutely, it should never be a required class because, you know, some people want to examine these things and others don't. And that's their prerogative. You get to set the boundaries about what kind of work you want to do and where you want to do it and how you want to do it. And so uh, I would say, first of all, absolutely do not make it mandatory. No mm -hmm. one should be, have to do this. Um, second of all, um, I would give people a little bit of time. Uh, I, I think a lot of companies do this anyway. You can go and um, choose how to use your leadership development dollars. They give people money and they can take whatever mm. courses they want, do whatever things they want. So to the extent that you have something like that, a, a set of resources available for people who are interested, they can go there. And again, people who are not interested can go take a finance course or, or some other kind of, of, of thing. So um, resources uh, are very key. I think that people should have the liberty to say, you know, um, this is a goal I'm working on. I'd love some feedback because if you are engaging in something in provisional selves, it would be good to get other people's points of view. So uh, allowing people to say, I'm working on some things. Can I get some feedback from you? I'd like your thoughts on this. Uh, so create a culture where people are open to learning and, and improvement and, uh, and helping people along. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I said that was my last question. This is my last question. I promise on this, on this topic, I'm curious. So, um, I'll take a roundabout way of getting here when we, you know, Nash consulting work with executive teams, for example, and there is a you know, pretty strong foundation of trust already, um, on that team. Mm -hmm. You know, some of the questions we sometimes ask as just a kind of team building exercise, we didn't come up with these questions on our own, but it's, you know, how many siblings did you have? What was your birth? What was the birth order for you? And then what's a significant challenge that you'd be willing to share that you overcame? And I'm realizing as we're having this conversation that there's a reason why that exercise really helps open a team up and helps them kind of improve their trust and respect with each other. Because in a sense, you're kind of getting at family systems in some form or fashion there. And my question here is, if you are working with an executive team as a whole, you know, do you have maybe questions you would have them explore together to help unlock a little bit more around, you know, some kind of the why behind some of their behaviors that they're seeing amongst each other in the group format? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think you could easily identify the idea of ghosts and just send it out there and say, okay, um, what are some family ghosts that you've seen yourself play out in, in the workplace? Um, and mm -hmm. how are they both serving you and not serving you? And how can you think about re redoing uh, that in some way, shape or form? Um, I'm also just... It's probably not the best place to put it, but I'm gonna I'm gonna add it in. I was just thinking yeah. that one can help other people can can kind of ring in with um, ideas once you ask people what their family um, 
what their family configuration was and what roles they played uh, in their family. That often gets a lot of things up. And I was just thinking for you as uh, age nine, having uh, an adopted brother with a lot of needs, I just wonder if you in, you were independent and maybe it was scary not to be independent because if you had to rely on the system that was over overloaded, you had two sisters, mm -hmm. a needy brother, that that would be problematic, that you were actually serving the system by mm -hmm. being independent and that you might at some level feel like, uh, I'm not serving the system if I'm not independent because the system can't take uh, more of that. I don't know. That's just a, yeah. something I would play with in, in asking you about it. But but you can get people to sort of ask some questions um, about uh, family dynamics and, and how they play out uh, hmm. and what impact they might have. Uh, yes. Yeah. The other thing is... Um, uh, Part of part of what I do in life is not just teach and do research and consult, but create mm -hmm. leadership development tools. And I hadn't actually thought about this until just now, but I always have these at my side. So so we have these cards that we've developed. They're just picture cards, and I use them for for everything. I use them for um, what is your leadership signature, what is your team identity, what is your organizational culture, but. Mm -hmm. uh, you were in a group and you wanted to open some things up. Um, these are just sort of pictures um, of, oh, of different, different, this one's upside down this way. Um, actually, these are all upside down here. Huh. People might just look through the cards and sort of say, are any of these emblematic of some family ghosts that you bring to the table? Um, was mm -hmm. your family all about risk taking and we all took risks or was it all about that's I'm referring to this. Uh, wow. Was it not about risk taking? And so risk taking is difficult for you. Um, is it all about trying all kinds of different things and um, being open to different, uh, different dishes and different everything, mm -hmm. or were you closed? And so opening up uh, to things that are different and changing is difficult for you. So some kind of, mechanism i i love pictures and i i love working with with the cards for everything because they they just kind of work with people at at a level that if you have to verbalize it is much harder yeah i really love that wow that's a unique approach that i that, that's new to me where could we find those where could we where could we yeah well this particular deck truth and advertising is um a resource that I developed, um, and so you can get it at xlead.co, which is the name of um, of the company that that makes them. Um, and there are other there are other card companies around, um, but this one uh, was developed with some of this idea of it's an exponentially changing world, and what do we need yeah. to know in that world about ourselves, about our teams, about our organizations? Okay, good, amazing, and you know that's. That leads me to my next topic here with you. You know, the question I wanted to ask you is, you know, when you're looking ahead three years, five years, 10 years, what do you believe are the most critical leadership um, skills that leaders need to develop in order to really effectively navigate the complexities and continuous changes in the world, economy, workplace? Yeah, a uh, good question. Um, so one of the things, um, the behaviors that dominates both our individual model of leadership and our team model of leadership is the idea of sense making. And mm -hmm. I think sense making is one of the most neglected capabilities in the leadership development landscape. We almost never see it. And, you know, eight years or so ago, um, would ask leaders what what makes for a great leader what are the most of, what what are the things that you need to be a great leader and you'd get the visioning and relating to others and um, execution um, as as the core biggies, sure. which are in a lot of leadership models, including our own. but mm -hmm. almost no one and I don't mean the term sense making I mean the activities of sense making almost no one 
talked about. It was it was um, yeah. literally 0.4 percent of the responses from executives of what makes for great leaders did sense making come in. Hmm. Fast forward to today, and it's up above 25 percent. People need to do sense making in this world. Now, what is sense making? Sense making is a term coined by Carl Weick. It means making sense of the context in which you are operating. If our world is zooming along, then we cannot rely on our mental model of that world. It's it's an old model by definition because things are moving so quickly. And so sense making requires that you say, What's new and different out there? What don't I know about that world? How do I have a fingers on the pulse of what's going on in that world? You need mm-hmm. to do your sense making in order to update your map of reality. Well, maybe are my customer preferences still the same or they want other things? Is my competitor behind me or have they jumped ahead? Uh, mm-hmm. What are the changes in technology? How will I use AI and not use AI? How are other people using AI? Um, so. Sense making is about really mapping that environment. And to do that, you need to be open minded. Um, okay, I, I don't know everything. You have to say, I don't know. I used to know, but maybe I don't know anymore. So there's a, a capacity to learn and a capacity to talk to other people outside, people who've done what you want to do or are further ahead on the innovation path, who are experts, who, uh, so vicarious learning, learning from others is part of sense making. And then pulling it all together. Okay, what did I learn or what did my team learn by going out and interviewing customers and interviewing um, other stakeholders in, in the world? So I would say sense making underline, underline, underline. Uh, in fact, I, I just started posting a bit on, on AI and how leaders are just, what do I do? And sense making is step one. If we don't really understand it, that what is the technology? And what's working and what's not working. And when I have an idea of how to use it, who else is in that domain and what can we learn from them? Um, so sense-making would, would reign big, as was, um, as is what you and I were just talking about, which is this idea of paradoxical thinking. We can't do either or anymore. It's, it's got to be both and. We have to be good at um, execution but we also have to be good at innovation. We have to be short-term and we have to be long-term. We have to be both and. You need to be centralized sometimes and decentralized other times. I have to be the strong leader. There you are. I have to be the strong leader sometimes, but um, not be the strong leader at other times. I have to go down to let others others lead as well. That's um, Lindy Greer. I always talk about Lindy Greer's work of the hippo theory of leadership. Um, When a hippo, when you have something to say and you know you have to be in charge, okay, there's a fire, folks. Hippo comes out and roars. Everybody do this, get here. Or there's a big deadline. All right, we have to do this, this, and this. Let's get to it. But what does the hippo do after roaring? The hippo goes underwater, right? If mm-hmm. you as a leader don't go underwater, you're not going to allow for other people to be able to get airtime. So um, paradoxical, both and. You have to get on that paradoxical thinking. Um, the other thing for individual capabilities, and, and maybe we'll stop there. I, I could go on and on for teams and organizations, but that might be beyond our, our time limits. Um, the other thing is telling your, your leadership story. Um, we do a lot of work on storytelling because if you live in, in an age of uncertainty and turbulence, there's not a whole lot of stability. So by the leader, talking about who he or she is, you create one modicum of certainty. This is who I am. You know who it is that is, you know, taking the wheel in this in this stressful time, that there is someone who is in charge. It might be in charge and including others, but there's someone at the helm who's taking us through these troubled waters. Two, You're decreasing uncertainty by virtue of letting people know, okay, um, I'm a a numbers person. So when you come into my office, have a spreadsheet, uh, have your analysis done. Let me know why you're thinking that way. You give people cues so that they don't have to have more uncertainty about what do I do when I walk into the office? What are the expectations of my leader? Um, Are you... 
bring me new innovative ideas. And then I go in knowing that I'm not supposed to just blah, 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 the same thing, but here's something new and different. So you're providing cues and an anchor for your people by telling your leadership story. And, um, and, and that's very important. So I would say that, that those things, um, as well as visioning, where are we going? People want meaning in this world. People want to know it's all crazy now, but what are we trying to do? And why is it important? Um, so mm. communicating those things is, is I think what is needed today. Yeah. Are, are some of these skills that you've outlined here, right, sense making, open minded, kind of both and thinking, storytelling, are some of them sequential? You know, for example, do you really need to work on the, uh, the sense making aspect of your leadership approach prior to going to the visioning, right? Because you kind of need to make sense of the environment before you can vision. I don't know if that makes sense, but I'm just, maybe help me out with this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I think in, in certain situations, you may have already been in an organization or big in a team and you come in with a vision because you've already done all that. That's fine. But yes. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, our research shows that sense making helps you to be better at visioning it helps you to be better at execution because you have a better idea of what you're facing and it builds trust because people want to be with leaders who understand the current environment. They don't want you to be, I don't know. Um, they, they really trust leaders who engage in sense-making. So yes, very often sense-making comes before visioning, but, but your model is very much a sequential one. You do your sense making. Our model of our leadership model is sense making, relating, visioning, and inventing, and then building your credibility. That's the the four caps model that we developed mm -hmm. at Sloan. Um, and unlike a lot of change um, models that are out there, in an exponentially changing world, it really doesn't make sense to be sequential. What you are doing is, all right, I'm doing some sense making. What have I learned? That means I need to invent some things, change some things in the organization. That might shift the vision to be, because we learned something, that means the vision has to go in, in another way. All the while, while we're relating and pulling different people together to work on what has to be done. So it's more of a sort of circular, we're sense making and then we're, we're, relating and and inventing and visioning and and then you go back because it it's not a stable kind of thing we're done um mm -hmm. it's it's an ongoing set of things that you need to be doing yeah even that right there just um also reminds me of kind of that both and thinking as well right you 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 both need to start somewhere and work on multiple things at the same time right it's not either mm -hmm. it's not either or you were also going to mention, maybe it was just with just the few minutes we have left here, kind of zooming out from the individual level to the team level or organizational level. Could you just maybe give us a few tidbits on some of those skills and behaviors that are important at that level? Sure. Um, yeah. Um, so teams, I've been studying teams since my dissertation a long, long time ago. And um, I wish I had had... Henrik and myself, as well as David Caldwell, the folks I've done the, this research with, um, you know, ask hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of executives, what makes for an effective team? And every single time I ask that question, almost with, without exception, I get the model that is literally burnt in our brains. Clear goals, clear goals clear goals, clear roles, clear agendas, good communication, good problem solving skills. You get the picture on and on about the internal processes, get the right people in the room, get the right perspectives mm -hmm. in there. It's all about what goes on inside the team. And mm -hmm. the whole uh, idea behind X teams is that that internal view is only half the story. It's not wrong. You need all those things. You need psychological safety. You need synergy within the team. These are proven. But just looking inside is not what's needed 
in an exponentially changing world. You need to go what we call out before in. You need to go out across your boundary to learn, to sense make, to partner, uh, to uh, figure out what other organizations are doing, who you need to work with in order to get your goals accomplished. So the X team book is all about out before in. How do you take the internal process and marry it to the external activities that are needed in this world? Because if you don't, you're, you're liable to get stuck in a bubble that doesn't take into account, oh my goodness, well, I'm in pharma and I'm developing a drug and I need somebody else's expertise to figure out how do we get that drug to the place in the body that it needs to be. Hmm. We can't wait 10 years to develop that capacity. We need to move fast. So let's find a partner who knows how to do that. And boom, there's synergy. Hmm. Um, that's more and more how work is getting done. Uh, the need to partner across boundaries is enormous. And so um, you need to be externally oriented as well as internally oriented. You need to get your team together and say, once a week, everybody go interview a customer. Everybody go um, learn about mm -hmm. the AI applications that are most important for the work that we're doing. Everybody go back out and find out who's ahead of us competitively. Uh, find mm -hmm. out what the biggest customer needs are. Um, so get that ex exification muscle going. Uh, so that's... Mm -hmm at the team level um, and at the organizational level. Um, again, we have another article um, with uh, Elaine Backman and, and uh, Kate Isaacs on what we call nimble organizations, walking the line between creativity and chaos. The idea being, mm -hmm. how do you actually provide autonomy without creating chaos? Um, so right. this is good for you, Ethan, right? Because you want to give autonomy, but you don't want chaos. Your fear of, oh my God, everything's going to go wild. But companies that are really good at this, they don't have chaos. They have hmm. simple rules and they have all kinds of mechanisms to help you to have control, but not in a bureaucratic sense. And they have different leadership roles that help them to create that nimble, agile learning organization. Um, so again, um, I'm, we're out of time, but I have a lot of readings on this. Uh, there are a lot of tools on this. There are courses. So um, if anyone wants to follow up, um, if you want courses, look at executive education at MIT, um, and you can see what courses are available there on, on the four caps plus model or X teams or, or nimble also on family ghosts. Um, if you want more readings uh, and tools and resources, then go to xlead.co and you can find some of those there um, or just listen in on LinkedIn. So um, if any of this is intriguing and you want to follow up um, just those are places to go to help. Amazing. Thank you, Deborah. I, I got to say I have, like a billion different action items for just myself from this conversation here, which I'm excited about and resources that I want to check out and, and dig into a little further. And knowing what I know about our audience for this podcast, I think they're going to be really excited to um, also dig in more to the work that you and your colleagues are doing. I appreciate you coming on the show. We'll link to everything in the show notes that we mentioned today for everybody to find easily. And yeah, Deborah, this has been awesome. Thank you very much. And thank you. You are, uh, you know, one of the um, one of the key. I didn't talk about this capabilities of leaders in an exponentially changing world is the ability to ask good questions. And you are definitely amazing asking good questions and and listening and and uh, moving the conversation forward. So it's been a real pleasure. And thank you for inviting. Me. Awesome. Well, well, thank you for saying that. All right, folks, go check out all the resources and thanks for listening in.